essential job of the cerebellum is that is to make the actual movements that we make equal to the movements that we intend to make. So if the cerebellum is working right, actual equals an intended. To make sure, to compare actual and intended, to see whether the job is being done, to make sure that the job gets done, we need a, a signal that tells us about the actual movement, and we need a signal that tells us about the intended movement. The signal that tells us about the intended movement is called efference copy. Here we go. Here is a motor control center, and it sends information off to a motor, alpha motor neuron. It may also send uh, information to inner neurons, and along the way, it also gives off a collateral that tells, as it turns out, the cerebellum uh, what it's doing. So it gives a copy of the order, uh, and there's a telephone, there's a game of telephone here, so that the efference copy that the motor control center puts out may be a little bit different than the, uh, than the message that the alpha motor neuron in, in the end receives. Why is it different? Well, for one, the alpha motor neuron has a few more ears than just an ear to the, to the upper motor control center cell. So it's getting inf other information from more local uh, neurons. And so it's, it's the, uh, the actual command that's put out may be a little bit different from the first efference copy. All of, this, all of these different versions of efference copy go to the cerebellum. So the cerebellum knows what is the intended movement. Now, how do we figure out what's the actual movement? Well, again, we have to, we're only finding out about the actual movement after the fact. And we can't correct an a ongoing movement. We can only correct forward. So this is a feed forward system. I cannot emphasize that enough. So how do we get um, information about the, the actual movement? Well, we get it from our various muscle afferents both the, the spindles and, uh, and the 1B, the Golgi tendon organ, so 1A and 1B afferents, and also from, from skin. And it, it is a tribute to how much this matters uh, to, to see the effort that Ian Waterman had to put in and has to continue to put in to move in a smooth fashion. Um, so, this information comes back and tells the cerebellum what, inf what was the actual movement. Ian Waterman doesn't get this. He, his cerebellum doesn't get this. The only way he can figure out what's the actual movement is if he can see it. So if he can't see it, the movement didn't happen, the movement doesn't exist. He can only compare it using vision. All right, um, but we do this very quickly without any conscious uh, engagement, we do it using this reafference from both muscle afferents and, and these low threshold skin um, uh, receptors or sens sensory uh, neurons. And it's a, con it's a comparison between these two um, that is made. Now, to see how that circuit works in, uh, in, in, uh, in the cerebellum, we're gonna go over to the board first to this this area. And the information about both efference copy and sensory reafference all comes in via mossy fibers. These are, these are fibers that come in from pre-cerebellar nuclei. So in the case of, say, um, sensory afferents coming in from the spinal cord, there is uh, there's a specific nucleus that gives rise to the, the neurons that project into the cerebellum. In the case of, say, efference copy from the uh, cerebral cortex, the information from cortex has to go through the pontine nuclei. So cerebellar cortex is very similar to um, cerebral cortex in the sense that no one can talk directly to, uh, to, to cerebellar cortex, you have to go through a, an approved way station. You have to go through an improve, approved translator. And for, for all the cerebral input to the cerebellum, that translator is the pontine nuclei. So the bulk of the mossy fibers come through the middle cerebral peduncles, um, and 
and those are coming, those are getting information. The, the, the mossy fibers in the middle cerebral peduncles are from the ponti nuclei. They get input from the cerebral cortex. So the mossy fibers project into the cerebellar cortex. This is all cerebellar cortex onto cells called granule cells. These are the half of all the neurons in the, in the human brain or in the mammalian brain are granule cells. Um, so there are lots and lots and lots and lots of these. Uh, they're very small, they're very densely packed. The mossy fibers come in, they talk to them. A lot of mossy fibers will converge on one granule cell. And then the granule cell sends up an axon that bifurcates, and it bifurcates in this direction, orthogonal to the orientation of the Purkinje uh, cells. And so these parallel fibers, and it's called parallel fibers because as there's 45, 40 plus billion of these uh, granule cells, and they're all doing this. And so you just, up here, all you see is fibers. Fibers going like this, they're in parallel. And if you, if you cut like that, what you see is just these densely packed fibers, all cut in complete transection. That's what you see. So it is these parallel fibers that are producing input on, or, or uh, uh, driving the Purkinje cells. So each parallel fiber has a very small effect. It, it has a, it, um, the response to parallel fiber input is called a simple spike. It's just a, a single action potential. And any one parallel fiber is, un, in, uh, is not able to drive a simple spike. It takes a lot of parallel fiber inputs to drive a simple spike. Um, OK, and that is in stark contrast to the other type of input from uh, the other anatomical type of input, which is from climbing fibers. And climbing fibers only come from the inferior olive. So that, and, and you can remember that, OK? This is my second favorite mnemonic, which is that climbing fibers come from an olive, olive tree, olive tree, climbing. OK. Um, so here's the climbing fibers. It's, they're going to wrap around. They're going to completely, uh, they're going to have a huge effect on um, a Purkinje cell. A Purkinje cell only gets input from one climbing fiber. Climbing fiber provides input to a few Purkinje cells. Um, and this is the teaching signal. And what this looks like is, is here. It's, this is a complex uh, spike. It is the most, it's the highest yield spike. So you put in one spike and you get out on the order of five spikes or spikelets. So this is a very, uh, this is a plateau potential upon which several um, uh, spikes are riding. So the effect of this climbing fiber is, is, is big. It's a big effect. Um, let's look, let's go back to the slides and take a look at, at what we think this, how we think this circuitry might work. Now, a, a, a detailed understanding is not going to, um, we, we don't have time for that and we don't have, we don't in, in fact really have that yet in neurobiology, although we've, we have a lot of clues and there's been a lot of work and it's a very, very vibrant field of research. So here's just to reiterate, the mossy fibers come up. They converge onto a granule cell, which sends a fiber up above the layer of the Purkinje cells into, and into the, where the dendrites of the Purkinje cells are and bifurcates into parallel fibers. If we look at a section of the uh, cerebellum and we're looking at a coronal section, we see that there are these different uh, little zones, microzones of different Purkinje cells. So the, these Purkinje cells may uh, deal with um, the, the wrist, and these may deal with uh, the elbow, and these may deal with elbow adduction, abduction, and so on. Um, and, and what you see is that they're, the parallel fibers give you a way of, even though what you're doing is you're moving your wrist, well, maybe the shoulder should know about the fact that you're moving your wrist. So this gives you a way of, of knowing, of the, the cerebellum knowing all the various movements that are going on, allowing the left side of the body to coordinate with the right side of the body. 
and in it is this uh, is this um, both local and global information processing that that is really uh, so important for the cerebellum, and so that we not only do we make these coordinated movements, but we don't fall over as we do them. Okay, that is the that is the key to the cerebellum. In the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the specific tracks that carry efferents copy and reafferents information into the cerebellum. <laughs>